Welcome to ILTV's Insider. I'm Aaron Porras, and our focus today, an alleged attempted coup on our eastern border. Jordanian officials arresting nearly 20 government critics and placing under house arrest Prince Hamza bin Hussein, former crown prince to the Hashemite kingdom and half-brother to King Abdullah II. Prince Hamza discussing his house arrest online in violation of the government's gag order. I'm making this recording today to try to explain what's happened over the last few hours uh, with me. According to the prince's message sent via his lawyer to the BBC, Hamza's security detail has been removed. Communications to his home were cut, including phone lines and internet. And Hamza was ordered not to speak with anyone outside of his family, including on social media. And all this despite the Jordanian authorities confirming to him that Hamza himself had not made any problematic statements. Rather, it was simply his being present during discussions critical of the government that is causing problems for the state, especially as some of these other critics are allegedly calling for popular protest against government corruption. At any rate, joining us to discuss is Middle East expert and lecturer at Bar Ilan University, Mordechai Kedal, and fellow with the Jewish People po uh, Policy Institute, Reserves Major Dan Pfefferman. I'm so sorry for butchering that. But thank you both so much for coming in today. Now, my first question, and Dan, I'll actually start with you. Hamza rep repeatedly has taken to social media through various channels since his arrest to expose the conflict from his perspective. He's denying any involvement in any conspiracy or nefarious organizations or anything like that, but he is speaking out against increasing stymied, stymied corruption, nepotism, and misrule. What do you make of his allegations? It seems to me, you know, uh, we had all the palace intrigue in London recently with uh, uh, the prince or the former prince going. I think we wanted some of that palace intrigue here in the Middle East. This seems to me to be uh, kind of some kind of competition, maybe a power play within the Hashemite royal family. And uh, King Abdullah wants to maybe quietly quiet his uh, dissenters and his critics. And uh, we can call it maybe one of his rivals, uh, his half-brother Hamza, the former crown prince, is trying to use this uh, and trying to play up the fact that he's maybe being jailed, although they're, they're denying the fact that he's being jailed, uh, to show that he is a voice of anti-corruption, a voice of competence in the country, as uh, the country has been hit kind of hard by uh, economic downturns and, and COVID. So uh, hard for me to imagine that there's any kind of coup attempt here. Um, seems to be more a bit of palace intrigue and some brotherhood rivalries. Well, so do, would you agree that it's like a, you know, a... a reverse coup, so to speak, to, to maintain power under King Abdullah, just because, you know, he removed Prince Hamza in 2004, he removed his title. Well, I, I do agree, yet, uh, during the last couple of months, the king became much more sensitive to criticism, mainly because of the economic issue. Uh, the COVID destroyed the income from tourism. And the tourism was like 20% of the general income of Jordan. J just imagine, 20% just wiped out, uh, in addition to all kinds of other things which they suffer from. Uh, uh, last week, uh, there was a failure in one of the hospitals in Salt, where some 10 people died because the electricity was cut off from the inhaling uh, machines, means, they, they, they died for no reason. They could continue and maybe even recuperate. But they died because of the COVID because these machines uh, uh, couldn't work without electricity. And this is something, a, a failure which could be prevented. Means that during the last months, the accusations against the economic problem, the economic crisis, uh, actually is directed against the king in the streets because uh, of what he said, the nepotism and corruption, all these things, which now becomes much more acute because of the dire situation of the people in the streets. And um, add to this the, the problem which they have already for 10 years, the refugees from Syria, like a million, uh, compared to like 8 million people of, of, the, of the country, million people refugees who they have to, to feed and to drench and to, to, to care for them. This is a big burden on the shaky, anyway, uh, uh, economy of Jordan. So when you, when you accumulate all these things and the accusations against the, the king, which rose during the last couple of months, the king became much more sensitive to any criticism. And when Prince Hamza, who might have some kind of uh, uh, 
reservations about what happened with him personally when he was removed from, from the, being the crown prince. Uh, uh, now he is the usual suspect that if he meets with all kinds of people, and actually he met with the Majali uh, um, tribe recently with the, and tried to make them with him as if, it, if, as if he is against the current crown prince, Hussein ben Abdullah. Okay, so there is a, behind the scenes some kind of a struggle on who will be the successor. Will, be, will it be the son of the king or the brother of the king? So here we are. Yeah, I think it, it's 100% right. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, Jordan's been undergoing a lot of economic stress. The refugees from Iraq also, still from, from 2003. 2003. And all the Syrian refugees, 10% uh, of the population is, is refugees. And so you add to that, you add the, the lack of uh, tourism income. So there are a lot of problems. There are a lot of problems that are being compounded, and I think he's uh, maybe taking advantage of this. He's trying, you know, there are three uh, focuses of power in the country, the military, the mukhabarat, the intelligence apparatus, and, and the tribes, like Dr. Kedar said. And uh, he's popular with the tribes. He's popular with the tribal elders, with some of the more conservative elements in the country. Um, and so it seems like he's maybe trying to garner power um, and that's kind of part of what's feeding into it, is the, the timing of the situation and then uh, the, the growing criticism. We have to look at that as absolutely as, as one unit. Well, so, so it's been largely argued that without the support of the military, which largely supports King Abdullah, that there's no chance a coup could actually even be successful. Uh, there's also argument that, uh, that Hamza is being used you know, just his presence being at these critical discussions is, is being used against him. How, how in the know do you think he is in, in terms of his influence on these meetings? Do you think he's, he knows exactly what he's doing and, and who he's speaking with, or is he being used? Look, he knows the rules of the game, that you are not supposed to challenge the king, you're not supposed to even to criticize, even implicitly or even take part in an event where you suspect that criticism will be, will be heard. You have to be very careful. And he should be, you know, he should sense the sensibilities of the, of the king. However, uh, uh, we have to, to point to another problem which also could show the sens sensitivity of the king. Last week was the Pesach. And uh, like 2,600 Israelis went to the Temple Mount. And apparently, some Palestinians didn't like it. And they said that the Israelis are running to the, to the Temple Mount, and too many of them, of course. So the king, since the king is the custodian, uh, according to the peace agreement from 1994, wow. of, of the Temple Mount, he felt that he should issue a complaint against Israel because Israel actually is, you know, too many Israelis and Jews are violating the sanctity of the Temple Mount. So well, it, wasn't, it was not unusual what happened. But since there was some kind of criticism from the Palestinians about what Israel is doing to the place which is under the custodianship of the king, he felt that he should issue a complaint against Israel in order to show that he is actually acting according to his responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis the Temple Mount. Okay, so all these things I, I, I put into one frame which actually shows how sensitive uh, the king is in uh, doing this, I would say, couple of months uh, which we are talking. All right, well, so, so this actually brings me, and we touched on this just a little bit ago, but what, what exactly is the demographic breakdown today in Jordan, and how do they feel largely, you know, by and large, about the, about the Hashemite kingdom, about the fact that King Abdullah and his lineage, which, as I understand it, is a minority, ruling? His lineage are 70 people. The, the family, the ruling family, are like 70-something people who were actually expelled, when well, their forefathers were expelled from Saudi Arabia. They are not locals. And this is their major problem of legitimacy. They are, as they say in the Arabic, mushminna, not from ours. So, okay, they have good relations with the Bedouins, but they are not Bedouins. They came from, the, from, from Mecca and Medina, 100 years ago. Means the Saudis kicked them out, and the British gave them a job means the Abdullah the first, a job to be the emir of Transjordan. And this is their most basic problem. Because everybody in Jordan, both the Bedouins and the Palestinians, which are the majority, look at the ruling family as, who brought you here? What are you doing here? What the heck are you doing here? Mm. And this is 
above everything. Yeah, and it's important to remember that uh, just over half of the, pa the population of Jordan are Palestinians uh, from pre-48 and from 67 who, who live there and who are not even of the Bedouin tribes. Add to that the refugees. So it's a precarious situation. And, uh, you know, throughout the Middle East, we, we see different kinds of regimes, different kinds of uh, kingdoms or, or other kind of regimes that are, are trying to maintain stability, trying to provide stability for, for their population. And uh, when the economy gets difficult, when COVID gets difficult, when you have uh, challenges, let's say, from the Muslim Brotherhood elements um, or from ISIS or from the Syrian civil war, uh, all of these things become even more challenging for the regime to maintain that hold on power and to maintain that stability. All right, now we talked a little bit about Harabait, uh, the Temple Mount, and, and Jordan's relationship to Israel through that and through the religious waqf authority. Uh, but it's not, it's really not just the waqf. I mean, I mean they're our ally, they're our neighbor. They, we have a lot of different economic and security interests that we share with them. Defense Minister Gantz recently just said as much that he would support uh, King Abdullah in, in quashing this so-called coup. Where, where does Israel fit into this? Well, don't forget that, first of all, we, the longest border which we have from the Kinneret uh, the Sea of Galilee, all the way down to Eilat. This is the border with, uh, with uh, Jordan. And Jordan keeps this border, so no terrorist will cross and nobody, you know. And, and so Israel can actually afford to reduce troop presence there as well. Right. So definitely this is a, an, an Israeli strategic interest to have this peace, as it is uh, believed by many Israelis. And add to this the fact that they are buying the Israeli gas, uh, you know, from the sea, and uh, more or less, uh, and the peace for itself is a good thing. This is why many Israelis consider peace with Jordan, and John, don't forget that Jordan is viewed as some kind of a buffer zone between Israel and the mayhem in Iraq, in Iran, whatever. So this is why many Israelis view this peace with the Jordan as a strategic asset for Israel. However, we pay a very high price for this. Why? King Hussein, with whom we uh, signed the 1994 peace agreement in the Arava Valley. Uh, he did not want Palestinian state, just like Rabin that time. They actually met, the, they had the same interest. The, neither of them wanted to see a Palestinian state because everyone, because of his reasons. When King, his son, King Abdullah II, came to power, he changed the policy. Now he goes to everywhere in the world and shouts, make a Palestinian state in Judea and Samaria even if the state will become a terror state by voting like Hamas or by coup d'etat has happened in Gaza. He doesn't care about us. Okay, why does, he, why does he want us to establish a Palestinian state in Judea and Samaria? Because he hears the Palestinians in Jordan talking about, the, as, as the Kony Arabic, al-Watan al-Badil. Watan al-Badil means the alternative homeland. Means if they don't have a state, in Judea and Samaria, yeah, they want a state, a Palestinian state, yeah. on the ruins of Jordan. Well, so, means, where, so where does that bring us? I mean, is, means, that, is that a realistic... Means that he wants us to establish a terror state above us on the hills which overlook Jerusalem and the entire Israel in order to keep his kingdom complete. So, I mean, where does that, where does that leave us? And, and where does that leave the Palestinians in Jordan? Yeah, I, uh, Dr. Kedar said it uh, perfectly well, uh, and, and I think if anything of this whole situation does one thing, it, it's not that we have to focus on, like I said, the palace intrigue or the rising criticism from the economic situation. It's that I think we here in Israel, uh, our, al our new allies in the Gulf and around the region and our, and our friends in Washington need to be looking very carefully at Jordan. This needs to be a wake-up call that we need to be looking at Jordanian stability. How do you shore up this shaky country that is a buffer state, like you said, and I think it's exactly what it is. It yes, allows but us listen, to limit our deployment, our military deployment, to shift our intelligence assets, which right now are focused on other parts of the region. Uh, the fact that we don't have to do that, that we don't have to have uh, so many troops lined up along the longest border in the region, in, in our country, the fact that we don't have to point our satellites and have our intelligence assets focused on Jordan, if Jordan's overrun by radical elements, if it's overrun by ISIS, um, which has tried to attack Jordan a number of times, um, that's a huge threat, and we'd have to refocus and restructure all of our defense assets. So this is something that we really need to consider, and as uh, Defense Minister Gantz said, 
Uh, everything that we can do quietly, because we're not so popular in the streets of uh, Jordanian public opinion, uh, we need to do to make sure to shore them up and, and keep them stable, because it's hugely important for us. And I think maybe it's been taken a little bit for granted in recent years um, what some of our statements or the discussion of annexation that we had uh, just last year does to uh, Jordanian stability and something we need to take no, no, into consideration. No. They do not want us to, enact, to annex even one centimeter on Judea and Samaria because they want a Palestinian state here. Correct. But I'm not sure that it is Israel's interest to establish a Palestinian state on our heads only to preserve the Jordanian kingdom. Uh, means b b if, if our security means not to establish a Palestinian state on Judea and Samaria and let there be a Palestinian state in Jordan, let it be. This is the Israeli interest. And not preserving this artificial kingdom, which the British invented only because they had to pay something to the Sharif Hussein, the father of Abdullah right. I, who lost because his he helped them, Saudi Arabia. He helped yeah. them with the, because, with, the, with the Turks in the, in the First World War. Whatever. I'm not sure that we should pay today with our existence or the threats on our existence uh, for something which the British Empire did more over the 100 years ago. I don't disagree with you. My point is that whatever it is we do regarding Judea and Samaria, regarding the West Bank, regarding the Palestinian state or no state, it needs to be done with a lot better coordination. And I think we need to take a step back and redevelop the strong strategic communications that oh, we yes, used to we have with coordinate. Jordan. We should coordinate Everything with should the Palestinian majority of Jordan to establish a Palestinian state on the ruins of Jordan, peaceful state, good state, flourishing state, we might even help it. I'm not sure. In all, wait, so you so like you think yeah you think that you, you think that Israel order, should work to undermine quietly or overtly should work to undermine the Hashemite Kingdom, peacefully, yes, they they have enough assets they stole enough enough money so they can build for the for themselves palaces all over the world. What do you think people are complaining in Jordan? I think that would be a disastrous policy for us to get involved in any kind of way in destabilizing. No, 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 no. First of all, you have to take care of your interests before you take care of others. Well, but what would interests. be what would be the result of that, though? Because you have, as so you said, we ha you have better. a Jordanian public primarily made of Palestinians but, 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 who but dislike Israel. Ex you have the Palestinians in the West Bank and, and Gaza, etc., no, no, no. who also largely dislike in, Israel. And if you establish in the a state, Maria, there, you implement the Emirate the, the Emirate uh, uh, solution. Emirate in Shechem, in Nablus, Emirate in Hebron. Are they, are they for this, though? I mean, that's... Of course, the families, said this a lot. the clans, definitely. It's a clannish society. What do you mean? And you, means Israel, uh, 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 annex the rural areas, while a Palestinian state, if there is any, will be in Jordan. Well, where is the problem? Anyway, Jordan's majority of population is Palestinian. Slight, why should there be... Slight majority. Why? Sir, three-thirds. Why should they be oppressed, and they are, by the Bedouins, whom they hate, and the king uh, and, and the royal family, which actually belongs in the Hejaz, in Saudi Arabia. Why should it be? Only because the British designed the Middle East in such a way? You're talking about a major upheaval of our neighbor to the east, a major part of the stability of this region at a time when no, no. Iraq is still not stabilized, Syria is still not stabilized, and so you're talking about so, overthrowing the most stable neighbor we've uh, ever had? This stability comes from the cost, in the cost of human rights, oppression of uh, the majority. Are you for this? The question is, would it cost more to enact the plan that you're, that you're discussing? Well, if it is being done in a peaceful way, means... By who? The, by the Palestinians of Jordan. They should unite and say to the king, okay, sir, a hundred years are enough, and uh, please, we want to see a, a timetable for independence. These are our borders, and this is what we want. Now, and I, if I, and if and when the Hashemite Kingdom, the Abdullahs, say inevitably no way, then what? No way. Okay, well, you, you have a problem with us. Well, but, the then, but then again, we go back to the initial the problem, which where you have look, the the military, which is largely supporting look, the government. independence is never given. Independence is taken by force. No country sets people free if it could keep them under rulership. 
And this is everywhere. This is in Iran today. You know, today there are, there are all kinds of minorities in Iran with, which demand independence. The Arabs in the Ahwaz, the Baloch, the Kurds, the Azeris. And, and there are today upheaval of minorities in Iran who want independent, independence from the Iranian occupation, as they call it. Mm. Why should be the Palestinians in Jordan be occupied by the ruling family of 70 people altogether who were expelled from Saudi Arabia only because the British Empire gave them some weapons? Hen? I, I think it would be hugely destabilizing, and uh, I don't think Israel will want to have any kind of part. Uh, quite the opposite, I think any kind of... I'm talking about justice. You're talking about justice. I'm talking about stability, and I'm talking about uh, regional stability, something that quite most of the rest of the region supports. Our new friends in the Gulf, uh, Saudi Arabia, everyone supports the stability. The United States has long rested on Jordan as a linchpin of its regional strategy, providing bases. Jordan has, has provided many of the troops that have fought against ISIS in uh, Syria and Iraq in recent years. I, I think it would be a, a disastrous mistake. Mm. Look, support, we just mentioned that everybody supported the king and sent him all kinds of messages. We support you. Just imagine, imagine that Hamza succeeded in a coup which allegedly... He, well, and they, he I mean, it wasn't even a, a after, real military one coup. Minute it was after, to, it was a one minute uprising. after he took over, if he took over, everybody will praise him. Oh, welcome to the new king. Okay. Everybody but he, but looks, he's a Hashemite also. Everybody looks to the, to the who won, and then we are after you. This is the, how, it, how the world works. But in, until the world stabilizes, then we have, we have a big mess, and I think uh, we'd right. rather not have to deal with any more messes than we have on our borders. And with that, unfortunately, I think that's our time. Thank you so much, Dr. Kedal, Major Pfefferman. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Aaron Porras, and please tune in next time on Insider for more on everything Israel. If there's a topic that you'd like us to cover next, let us know about it in the comment sections online. Finally, for more news from Israel, follow ILTV on Facebook, Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and ILTV channels. Thank you so much. Be well. We'll see you soon.